I said, uh, I started out as a, um, as a high school biology and environmental science teacher. And when Tony and I moved to North Carolina and I was teaching, I liked to have my kids go outside, but it was really tough because they didn't, a lot of them didn't want to be outside. They were afraid of being outside. Um, I, I taught in a, a school where a, a lot of the kids had not been exposed to being outside. And one of the things that I struggled with as a teacher in North Carolina is I didn't understand enough about North Carolina's flora and fauna to be able to give my kids really good examples. So when they were studying food chains and food webs, crazy as it is, I didn't have really good examples of North Carolina um, and always thought that, man, if I just knew a little bit more. So this opportunity came up to work with the Wildlife Resources Commission about 10 years ago, and I jumped on that opportunity, and it was um, uh, like a, the best of both worlds. So I was still able to teach in primarily when I first started with the, the uh, Wildlife Resources Commission, I was teaching, doing programs for preschool through adults, but mostly it was preschool to middle school kids. That was what our focus was. Um, that changed over the years and I'm now dealing more with adults and actually staff uh, development with our, with our own folks. But what was really cool is in being with the commission, it gave me an opportunity to learn all these things about North Carolina's flora and fauna. And I'm still a neophyte uh, in terms of that. My goal, one of my bucket list goals is that when I'm 80, I could truly call myself a naturalist. Because I, I look at other, I spend time with other naturalists and they just have this wealth of knowledge that is just like, ah, because they understand all the things that are going on around where they, where, where they are outside and it makes it more interesting and I, and I love that. The other thing that is fun though today is that we are the commission in the work that I'm doing with other folks. We can provide education tools to uh, elementary and middle school and high school teachers that focus on North Carolina um, connections. We just finished a, a, a seven series curriculum, small, on um, that goes with a program that the Wildlife Resources Commission is doing with the Museum of Natural Sciences in that is stationed in Raleigh, but it's across the state and with NC State, and it's called NC Candid Critters. You may has anybody heard of that program? It's, so it's, a, it's using remote cameras and placing them on property from uh, pro uh, your own property or out like uh, Babs and th this nature preserve would be an yeah, ideal place. For NC candy critters? Okay, on this property? Yeah, so it's a three year study that's being done and uh, they're trying to reach all 100 states uh, or all 100 counties and get all kinds of folks involved with it and it's a great just a fantastic interaction because remote cameras are just so much fun to see what's out there when you aren't out there. It's just so much fun. Uh, and so we're doing a lot with, with schools also and have developed this curriculum of seven lessons that take, take classes through the scientific process using candy critters and meets all the North Carolina standard course of study for sixth through eighth grade. So it's really fun. That's just like, uh, some, some things about what I do. But in doing this, I've learned a lot myself. And one of the things that, that just, I never ever thought this would happen, but I became very much interested in, in SCAT. And it just, ha it just has happened in the process of this job. So I, so I was, um, when I first started it, we had just rubber models that were disgusting. And you know, rubber models of SCAT is disgusting because real SCAT is not disgusting, right? And, but what is really fun is that the, with kids especially, the more disgusting you can be, just the idea, you gross them out right in the beginning, and then you get a fourth or fifth grader, you know, you go, oh, that's disgusting. They're looking at river otter scat. And you start talking to them about it, and that kid, I don't know how many times we have those kids engaged, and they're, they're measuring it, they're looking for the little pieces in it, they understand the animal, and it is just so much fun. So it's kind of become a passion of mine, and my, I'm actually known as a scat lady at my Work. And when I come in some days, no joke, there's scat 
on my, on my desk. Most times it is in a, in a bag or in a box. But yes, there, I've been known to have people leave scat on my desk and it, it is just, it's fun. But um, so about eight years ago, I was at uh, the Education Center in Pisgah which is, have any of you been to, we, we, uh, the Wildlife Resources Commission has a Pisgah Center for Wildlife Education. It used to be an old, well, it is still a fish hatchery. And I was there, and it was new to the commission, was still using rubber scat, went, off, went on one of their classes, and we hiked up the mountain, sat in this little space, and one of the instructors there was giving a program about beavers. And he pulls out this bag, and it's these little brown chips, and he acts like he's going to eat them. And it's like, what is that? And then he, it ends up, it's, it's beaver scat, and it's his whole engagement with kids. And what he did is he would collect scat and dry it and shellac it. Ha! Then started my passion. And that's what I've been doing ever since. And that's what these boxes are, and these boxes over here. And now, the, the other educators I work with, I, my box of SCAT was checked out by a woman who's a regional education specialist in, down by Wilmington. And she brought it back uh, Thursday so that I could bring it here. She's coming on Monday to check it out again, because it's so much better to use the real stuff than, than models or whatever. And it's just great. All right, so let's get to this tool that I, th this, um, find mine, the little scat card. So is there, like right now, uh, I'm sure there are people in here that know way more than I do about scat. You all can um, certainly add to the, the conversation, like if there's things I, I don't know. Um, but just raise your hand. If you are confident, without looking at the card, it, you are confident that you could identify one wild native animal scat, now not a domestic dog, so Bob, you can't raise your hand on this one, all right? But one, one, okay, what is it that you, at the back here, what would you be able to identify? Me? Mm-hmm. Oh. Uh, deer. Good. Beautiful. Okay, so when I'm asking, fantastic, I think that was six. When I'm asking, does somebody know, if you could just not answer first on some of those, all right? <laughs> okay, so you folks up here, any one of you, tell me what, which scat you are confident with what you can identify. Oh, great. All right. So when we get to Turkey, just give pe other people a chance, all right? Um, uh, what about you ladies? I think one of you raised... Coyote? Okay, cool. Very cool. Um, anybody else? Yeah. Deer and rabbit. Deer and rabbit. All right. Bear. All right. Okay, <laughs> cool. Well, then, uh, let's look at this card. And what this, this card is really cool because it sticks in your pocket. It has, it has a little measure at the bottom in inches. And it has, it has, a, it has a diagram of the scat. So this has the same thing. It has everything that the card has on it. We, I just didn't have enough cards to bring. Um, so it, it shows you the general shape of the scat. And the other cool thing that it does is it gives you an idea of what the diameter should be on average. It's not always going to be that. So with bear, you know, it's right now it says one to two inches. The bear scat that I have is straight out two inches. You might find, you know, variations. If you find a plop of bear scat in the coastal plains, it's definitely going to be way bigger than that. But it's a great starting place. And it's really cool. So um, flip to find... River otter. Yes, it would just be otter on here. Mm -hmm. So uh, river otter flip to the back, and it gives you some information about what the animal's diet is. And it tells you just a little bit about where it might be found, the scat might be found. So it starts to tell you some things that you can, do, you can use to recognize what it is that you're working with.
what are you going to be looking for if you're looking for, like, what, inside it? What might you be able to see? Scales, fish scales, or? Yes, and usually a lot of times it's crayfish exoskeletons, and you can really see those. So it looks, you know, they're showing you this shape. It may not, it may not look like that, but it will be found close to water. Um, it, I usually find it on, on banks, and I can always distinguish it because I either see fish scales or I see crayfish, and it's just very cool. And, it, and without a doubt, I know what it is. And I'm going to show you some other things about recognizing it where, where they go to the bathroom. So reading the, paying attention to the size and paying attention to the back is really important. And also looking at what the, kind of what its characteristic is, like its shape. So find Bobcat. Just uh, go to Bobcat and also find Fox. And in this case, it's going to be red fox or gray fox because they're not, they're not separating them out. Um, so let me find bobcat. If you had to describe to somebody the difference in shape, I look closely because this is a little bit tough. It's actually going to be easier once we go through some slides. But if you had to describe the difference to somebody else on the shape of fox or bobcat, what what would you what would be your descriptor that would distinguish bobcat from fox? Yeah, it's stringier. Mm -hmm. It definitely is, and it's more twisted in. Anything else? What, what do you notice about bobcat? Is there a characteristic that you call a little tip tapered shape, like on the fox one? Yes, yes. Um, it, well, they just say that it's more of a pointed end, oh. all right? And, and that bobcat, a lot of the description is, is that it's blunter or tootsie roll section like, as disgusting as that is, but it truly is. Okay, so we're going to use this, you just, we're going to refer to these, all right? And we're going to get started, and what I'm going to do is I'm going to show you some, some slides of scat, and then, we'll, and some of them are going to be really easy, others may not be as easy, but who knows? You may know them all, all right? Don't say it out loud right away. Give everybody a chance. And I've tried to put, like, the, the size, a size dimension on the scat, and then we'll go into some other things. All right, so... Um, yeah. Well, you'll have to wait and see. Yeah. At, yes, we're going we're gonna to do a little bit of a test at the end. So do you recognize this? Of course. <laughs> so it was so much fun to walk around. But yeah, we did find some yesterday. OK, so um, whose scat is that? All right, so don't say it out loud. Um, I'll give you a hint. It's two different animals. All right, but pay attention to the, the diameter or the size. Pay attention to the shape. So this one is more P-shaped, like a P. This one is more jelly bean. That's a little bit of a stretch, but you often see them jelly bean, like Harry Potter jelly bean with this, this animal. Kids would eat it up big time. Um, all right. Somebody? <coughs> yeah. Anybody know? Besides, but this lady told me that she already knew these animals. So, oh, no. <laughs> no? <laughs> okay, so hold on. Let me just see. Okay. You are exactly right. Yes, you got it. You got it. You're exactly right. Okay, so this is rabbit. It's more, it's more P shaped, all right, and it's smaller. And this one, deer, this one is more oval. Sometimes it looks even more jelly bean. All right, okay, so let's go to this. Look at this one. Who, who's in this? Okay, now look at it closely. Look at it closely. They're all together for a reason. So the, it's one half to five eighths inch. Okay, this is deer, all right. You think this is bear? What about this one? 
This is deer, and that's easy to, that's pretty, that's a pretty easy stretch, you know, going from here, because you can see that they're all clumped together. They're clumped together, but they're the individual pellets. So the, the, the deer was just eating something that, that allowed its scat to have more moisture to clump together. And for sure, like I show these little kids, young kids, and someone will go, oh, it's a rabbit. I go, no, like all three of these are together. And they'll go, oh, it's a rabbit. It's no way that's not a rabbit uh, because it, it's way too big for a rabbit. Here it is. This is the actual one. It's like, no, it can't be rabbit. It's way too big. So just like using those context clues, these are all deer, including this one. And this is crazy, I know. But this one I collected, and it is deer. Um, and what, what I think, I don't know for sure, and if somebody else knows, has a, a good idea or can reaffirm this, it... If you look at this, deer are browsers, uh, do you, and that means that they, um, they, pull, they pull leaves off branches, so you know they don't have the upper teeth in their, their mouth. They're, they don't have any incisors on the upper jaw. They have incisors on the bottom jaw. They don't, they don't have any canines because they're an herbivore, so they don't need the canines. But, so the way that they, they eat is they come up to a tree or a shrub, and they go like this, and their, their bottom teeth help them to pull the leaves off, but their browsers also, they can pull the tips off of the branches. So in the winter time, like this time of year, and in the spring, you can, you can see evidence of them by just walking around and looking for where trees look like the ends of their branches have been eaten off. So there's no leaves this time of year. In winter, they're still, they still need to eat. They don't hibernate, and their diet has changed. So it's much drier, and if you look at this scat, you can, it's little tiny pieces of wood that are in there. And that's why it, it looks so much different. It has a different, a different texture, it has a different color. It might be, yeah, sausage or something, yeah, yeah. So it tells you things about that animal. And then, uh, you know, for when, when I'm working with, with people that they, they start to get engaged and they get beyond that disgusting part. But it really, it, it's really interesting. So then here's another one. Um, of that one, so that one, so it's right here. And yes, it's, it's, so it's not going to go with the, it's not gonna go with the car, all right? It just won't. Um, Yeah, right. But it was found, like it, I found it in Raleigh, and we, it, we, you know, bears moved through there, but it, it wouldn't have been, and there was all kinds of signs of deer around. So I didn't, didn't see the deer uh, eliminating this, but, um, but yeah. Uh, so let, let me show you a couple of things here. So this was, um, I work on a campus in Raleigh that is part of uh, North Carolina State University, and it has a 100-acre uh, woods, and we, so we do a lot of work out there. We have had a lot of programs, and we have a, a box turtle connection program going on out there. So we're out regularly, and I found this uh, a couple weeks ago. Okay, so who's, who, left, who left these? Look at, look at the size here. I, I, put this, I put the size in because this one is a little bit, it's a little bit deceiving. Mm -hmm. Yep, so it's all those clues that you have to use. What do you, what do you think it is? Raccoon. Not ra it's not raccoon. Raccoon would be bigger, more, um, more Tootsie Roll again. I'm just going to use that term. So these are individual pellets, just like we saw before. It is deer. And these were, these were found in the same area. So here it is, it's clumped together, was in the same area and there were all kinds, I also saw trails around there and I could see bedding areas in, in the winter foliage, like the grasses that were still there. You could see where they had bedded down. Yeah, this, and uh, the person that said, well, it's way, this was a lot. So it, and it, and it was too big, like the size of the individual pellets was too big to be a rabbit. So that's deer. All right, cool. Let's go to the next I one. Left, uh, that, that left, that I, I... Really? Interesting. It might have been. Was but did it have a? Could you see a lot of seeds in it? 
I didn't hope that. <laughs> yeah, and you don't, you, you absolutely don't want to, with rac, you do not want to mess around with raccoon scat. Um, I do not have any for a reason. They, uh, they carry a parasite, and I personally do not want to mess with raccoon scat. I'm not even interested in if it's been there for a while, because it's a really serious parasite that, um, huh? Parasite. They carry a parasite that humans can, it can uh, I don't know the name, I, and I thought somebody was going to ask me. I just, I don't know the name. Of, does anybody hear that? I'll look it up. I just can't think of it. But um, it can do some serious damage, and I think it can actually do some, some serious damage to your eyes, like if you get the parasite. And anyway, you just don't want to mess around with raccoon scat. Um, if it's in your, you know, if, if, any, if you ever hear of somebody that has it in their attic, they really need to make sure they know how to clean it up. Um, carefully, and it isn't just you know going up there and wiping it up. Uh, you, you need to be really careful. All right, so this is. We'll come back to the raccoon one because I'm interested in that one. Um, all right, so this is real again. It's from it's from my it's from our collection. So I'm, it's three fourths of an inch in diameter. Why are you saying beaver? Wood. Yes. Yeah. The wood is a giveaway. Now a uh, beaver. It's, you don't find their scat very often because they usually go to the bathroom. Unlike other animals, they go to the bathroom in the water. And, but what is cool is this scat, they can only, they're, they're chewing down wood for what purposes? To make their, to, to wear their teeth down. So that's one purpose. There's three other purposes that they chew wood for. Yeah. Yep, the cambium layer is just inside the bark. So it's that inner, that's inner layer. They, they eat that for food along with, they will eat ferns and other plants, but they will eat that cambium layer. What else do they use the wood for? Their dams, yep, and, and their lodges. So there's four ways that they're using the wood. They, they can't digest all the wood. They have these little microorganisms. They can digest about 30% of the wood. They have these little microorganisms. So the, their scat at this point is really dry. So when they go to the bathroom in the water, if you're looking for it, you can find it and pull it out and put it, whatever. Um, but it, it, you don't see it as regularly as uh, up here where you see coyote scat or you see bobcat scat out on trails. You, don't, you won't see this around. So that's beaver. They happen to be just really fun. And uh, Bob and Babs were telling me that they don't have beaver here on their property. They've seen signs of them. You had them in, maybe in the past, but be, it has a lot to do with the way that the, the Walnut Creek uh, topography is in terms of its banks. Its banks are too steep. Um, and so it, it isn't easy for them to get in and out. Um, and there's a lot of, you said there was a lot of flooding, like quick flooding during rains. Well, let me show you. Mm -hmm. This is a little bit off topic, but for, is there such thing as a river beaver versus a regular beaver that builds lodges in the water that's around here? No, they're all the same. The, the, the beaver are all the same in so North they Carolina. they always have a lodge in the water, like in a lake and a dam? It, or do they it, live on land? They could, they could have their lodge on the side of the water. It doesn't have okay, to be in the water. I and a over by the Green River, and there's several places where there's just matted down trails. Uh huh. About this uh huh. Where the grass is matted down, like it's a path into the water. Yeah, they're slide. So, so it could. Is that's a river beaver. It could be a beaver, or it could be a. It could potentially be an otter. Also, otter have slides. Also. Yeah. Uh, if it, if they've been using the same one, it could. That's where it would be really fun to put up a remote camera and see yeah. what it is. Yeah. I mean, that's what's really fun about it. But let me show you some things. So where I live, it's completely different topography. Uh, and I'm going to show you where, so yes, that is beaver. This is the southern end of the campus that I work on in Raleigh. And this little creek is called North Creek. And so this just, you know, this, I took this picture um, actually last Thursday. This creek flows out into a 90-acre, 100-acre lake called Lake Raleigh, all right? Um, so notice how the banks are very different from Walnut Creek here. For the most part, they're low. Um, and it's really, it's really muddy. 
All right, so I was going to ask you what you thought would live here, but I've kind of given it away. Um, I want you to pay particular attention to this and this eventually, all right? But anyway, that's, so I was out here the other day, and I used to go out regularly and just hadn't been out to this place for a couple of years. I used to regularly go because we did programs. So I knew that there were beaver and otter out there. And I wanted, and it's winter, so it's really easy to see where they've been. Much harder in, this is all overgrown with all kinds of invasive species and things in the summertime. Um, so I wanted to go get some pictures that would, would work for here. I was hoping to find some, and I found this mother load of pictures the other day. In fact, I, my husband and I carpool, and he drives because um, I, need, I always am the person that is working longer. If I drive, the poor man has to wait much longer to get picked up than if he's driving himself. So he came the other day and he calls me, he says he's on his way, and I'm out here taking pictures, and it's like a 10-minute walk back to my my office. I go, okay, I'll meet you there. Of course, I didn't get back there in time because there were way too many pictures. But this, see this hole right here? And notice all this. All right, this was about 20 feet from, from the, the creek. And look at this right here. All right, and I'm, then I'm going to zoom in on all this. This is beaver activity right here. And it's like a mudding hole. And this is a place where they can, like a tunnel that they can go through. And there's, they're all over there. All right, and there's all kinds of trails where they, and you can see where they, they make channels where they, they drag, you know, they will make these channel trails, have them with mud, and that's how they float the, their, some of their trees and branches. Um, all right, so now I'm going to zoom in on this. There's the hole, and you can see right where they were going in all of this. This, this was the area on the other side, so this was the mud hole or a mudding hole, this right here is this. And I could see where they had just moved up there. And because we've had a lot of rain, I couldn't find any, any tracks. But I know that this is beaver activity. So then I looked around, and there's a slide right there. And, that, and the, the hole, I couldn't get a good picture, but this hole was just like six feet from that. So there was a trail from this hole to that slide. There's another mudding hole. That, and that one was one I took a couple years ago when I was on this mission to try to capture beaver with remote cameras. And I found all this activity. There were, you can't see it here, but we, it was due to beaver and then there, there's deer in there also. There's the beaver tracks. So this is what you would see their, their back track, their back foot is much bigger than their front foot, and their back foot is webbed to help them with the swimming, but their front foot is, is clawed, and that's what they use to dig up the mud and to pack the mud, so they, they're always packing it into their dams and their lodges, so they're, they're using it all the time. But you can see here where They've got five toes, so you clearly see four, and the, the other one is it's a little bit tough. But you can also see where the webbing is, and this was six inches. Um, so just so looking for different signs, and of course there's deer right there too. Um, so then I continued on, and it was a little peninsula, and I knew it, I was seeing signs of them all around. What is this on this tree? Anybody know what this is? It's poison ivy. So check this out. They chewed that poison. This was a big old poison ivy vine, and they just had gnawed it right off. A great, I mean, wouldn't that be great to have to get rid of all the poison ivy? I saw where Bob, you all had cut some poison ivy somewhere where we were yesterday. And this, anyway, it was just amazing. Here's the chips. So I continued on. There it is up close, and you can see the teeth marks. I've got a lot of examples of, you, it's so cool to find their finds because you can see right where their teeth are. And this lady said that they, they they're, so they're a rodent. They're the biggest rodent in North Carolina. They, their teeth grow continuously. The front ones don't wear down as, ba as fast as the back ones and that allows, like the back, the back part of the teeth wears down faster, the incisors. And so with that, it allows them to have more of a sharp incisor to be able to be chewing off the bark or chewing down the tree. And you can just, I mean, you can see right where their teeth marks are. 
All right, so I found that. There were signs, all kinds of chew there. But those, here's another one here. There were river birches that were chewed down. There was alder that was chewed. So here, it was all over the place here. So I continued on. There's some more. This was a huge tree. And I've, I've always wondered, well, why do they, I've seen a lot of big trees with, they're girdled almost all the way around. And it's, they're, sometimes they just girdle them to kill them because they're creating habitat. They want habitat that is a different type. I mean, they, they know that, they've got that, they don't know it like we know it, but they've got that instinct. Um, they will, they might girdle pine trees that way, either to use them as their lodge, not so much for food with pine trees, but to use them for their lodge. Or if, it, if they're starting to build a dam in a pine area, they don't want, pine trees aren't the type of tree they want, just like you all don't want them on your property. And so they girdle them and kill them. And then it opens up the sunlight and space for other, other vegetation to grow. So that was a, just a really good example and there I found it. Sadly, there was trash there. But this, this has been a lodge that's been at the end of the mouth of this creek for years. And I hadn't been out there for a couple of years. And it was so cool to see that it was still there. Because periodically, I, so I work on Centennial Campus. They have a lot of landscaping. They're really proud of the way the campus looks. And so periodically, they do bring a trapper in to trap the beaver out because they do so much damage. Um, and that is, that's part of management of, with North Carolina and wildlife management and uh, humans and animals coexisting, that there are times when uh, the, you know, the trapping allows them to, to take them out because they, uh, they're doing this damage. And, and beaver can do a lot, as you know, they don't realize it, but we live so close to them. So there hadn't been much sign of beaver for a couple years, but this year, it's all over the place. And, and it makes me laugh because they're so industrious, but yeah. For, for, there are ponds that do that for, for folks. Yes, that, that is one thing that can be done. Well, this is a this is a hundred acre lake, and that's a that is a creek that goes through there. And they have they have all of these runoff ponds that where where there's parking garages and all kinds of buildings, and they can't do that overflow thing the same way there. It doesn't it doesn't work in every situation, but it certainly is effective for like uh, different ponds on people's private property. Um, and there it is again. So this time of year, this is March, they're still mating, they're getting, they're actually getting ready to have their young. They, they bear their young between April and June, traditionally. Um, and yeah, so this, this was definitely an active lodge. That those were fresh branches right there. So it was, it was just really fun to see that. Okay, so that was beaver. And this was, these were trees um, on a greenway that I took this picture three weeks ago. This was a fresh chew. The sap was still dripping, and there was fresh chips here. And it was in a, just a really strange place where there wasn't any other sign of beaver, and there were young trees. This is a, this North Creek, and there were young trees all around here. And these two great big pine trees, they had almost chewed, well, that one way around, like three-fourths around. So that was three weeks ago. Last week, I was there again. There's those two trees. So pine sap has dried up. Here was another fresh one. This was fresh, fresh sap. Just um, Thursday or Wednesday or Thursday. My thought is with this one is they may be thinking that this, these are trees that they want to get rid of. This stream has not been dammed for a while. We've, they've had dams in there. They might be getting ready to build a dam somewhere. And I don't know, they're, do, they're getting their prep work done. It's just really interesting to see and it's interesting to try to figure out what's going on. Um, how tall are they? Are they how tall? This this was like this is two to this is two feet up maybe three feet up yes they can get that tall they yeah a, a big one I mean a big one could stand up they use their tail to to brace themselves and they they could I mean that is beaver damage um, so a couple years ago 
I was, I was on a mission. I told you I was trying to get, I was trying to get beaver footage. And this, this tra there was a, oops, sorry. Oops, let me go back. Oops. This, um, this is a, a dam right here, and there was a beaver trail over it, like right here. So my coworkers and I put this hunk, this old uh, remote camera on the tree. We were sure we were going to get beaver because it was, they were going right over it. We put it up like on a Thursday or Friday. I come up back on Monday and found this. So our, here's, here's our remote camera, and it was about a foot and a half up on the trunk. A beaver had chewed the tree off above it. And what we captured was its belly, its, its furry belly on our remote camera as it was chewing the tree down. It was just like, oh my gosh, uh, just funny. So eventually, I work with a, um, a trapper who is just this trapper extraordinaire, and he's, he really has been a mentor for me to understand a lot about animals and has been helped me with different programs. Um, so he, he puts together, when he's trapping animals, he puts together these, these lures and scents. He makes them himself. And I told him I was trying to find, I really wanted to get beaver on a video or whatever, and it, this is at North Creek, where, where this is, that's that bank. So, he shared with me that, well, all right, so you've got to find one of their caster mounds. And this is a caster mound right here. And what they do is they, they build up a little bit of mud on the edge of the bank, and then it might have leaves on it or whatever, and a, a beaver will put its own scent on there. It's caster, and it's marking its territory. So he had caster lure scent that he had made, a mixture of it, where when he traps beavers, he, he keeps their castor gland, or whatever it is, and saves the oil. And so he gave me some, he says, go put it on the mound, and just put it, you know, put a stick so you know where it was. That, and bam, got this guy. So this, this you can see that beaver, Checking out, coming right up and checking out the scent that is different from it. It's just checking that out and um, it walks over it, may not in this short one, walks over it and it might be marking it again for itself or whatever. So anyway, that was kind of fun. Um, okay, now let's go on to the next animal. All right, so whose scat is this? All right, so. I'm going to throw up two, same, same animal, just different color, all right? I'm showing you what the diameter is. Look at its kind of its shape. Look at these, this white, and look at this pink thing in here. So what would skunks have in them, Pro probably? Insects. Insects. So, do you, this is white, could, it could, it's skeleton, it would probably not, insects, exoskeletons usually don't turn white. Bones, uh-huh, so, did somebody say fish? Fish, mm-hmm. What else, um, yep, potentially. This is a, this is a little, it's hard to see, this is a pincer. This is a, probably a thorax of an exoskeleton, crayfish, all right? This is crayfish, and if you look at this one, see these little, almost like mica flecks, but it's not mica, but it's shiny little flecks, scales. Yeah, it's otter. Yes, it's otter, yeah. Um, so otter, again, it can look very different this one was eating fish. This one, when I found it, it was fresher and it was really dark. Sometimes when you find it, it's, it's slimy green from the algae that's in the water that comes out or whatever. This one was older, so the exoskeleton had dried out. It was much older. But let me show you some things, which is really fun. Same, do you recognize the location? Same location, so this was on North Creek. Um, 
pay attention. See, so this was last week, and most of, we've had really warm weather, so you can see where the trees are starting to green up, but a lot of the vegetation is still brown. Plums, right here, were green. There's a slide. So in the area where I found this, there's both signs, definite signs of beaver and definite signs of otter. And I, I'm not positive which, which slides are beaver and which are otter. But I'm pretty sure this one is otter, and I'll explain why. So here's a clump right here, OK? Um, and I, with the other one, I found that mud hole and some trails that led right to that. Okay, the one that I said was a, I thought was a beaver slide. So this one is right on that bank too, not far away, but look at these clumps of grasses. Otter have this habit of going to the bathroom in the same place, and they call it an otter toilet. We, we call it an otter toilet or a latrine, either one. They will pick the same place, just like us, to go to the bathroom. So check that out. Look at this. That clump of grass right there, when I got up close, you might not be able, it might look like leaves, but if I zoom in, there's last year's scat. I mean, it's old, but what's it doing for this clump of grass, or this <laughs> vegetation right here? Yeah, it's so much fun to see. And sometimes when they, when they um, have a latrine, it'll be on the edge of the bank, and they will, they will roll it over and get the grasses and the leaves in it. And this guy that is my trapping mentor, he was one of the people who brought scat and left it on my desk one day. He brought me, in a box, a latrine. Because it was like, it, we were going to do this program, and he wanted me to be able to learn more about this, so it, it was fun. Um, here's another example. So this, so this is the, this clump of grass, see that um, brown piece right there? Here it is right here. And there, that was just filled with um, otter scat all over the place. And here it is again. This, this is a latrine that we found um, down in Columbia, North Carolina, so in the coastal plains. And this was a, a channel that uh, like they build between the, the huge fields down there. And all along the edge of this channel, there was just one latrine after another. Just, um, I mean, we didn't see any otter, but we saw all the evidence of them. Uh, okay. So they're living in the same place, but they're doing it two entirely different things, so they're not competing for the same resources. And the beaver are actually, have you ever heard the term, just raise your hand, if you've heard the term keystone species. So keystone species is a, an animal, a wild animal, that is key to the habitat where it lives or that environment that it's living in because it creates habitat for other animals and that's what beaver do. So deer come and you know the ponds that they build, deer come and, and elk would come and drink from the ponds, but deer more where I live. Um, the, the trees that die, the woodpeckers come and drill holes in them or get the insects out of them and then other animals like can come and like flying squirrels could come and live there or wood ducks. Uh, the insects provide food for all kinds of things. So even though a lot of humans haven't don't want the beaver around and in fact they were they were extirpated in North Carolina. There were no beaver in North Carolina a hundred years ago, the turn of last of the nineteen hundreds. And a lot of it had to do because their, the trapping industry was really big. Their, their furs were really valuable. They were trapped to extinction locally in North Carolina. And so from the 1920s to the 50s, the, there was a program to bring them back into North Carolina. They brought them from other places, like from Pennsylvania, and I can't remember. For about 30 years, they did that. In 1990s, 
the, uh, there, was, there were so many beaver in North Carolina and they were causing flooding on roads, so DOT was having a problem. They were flooding the lower lands of a, a farmer's um, wooded acreage that they were depending on to cut for money. They were destroying that, just doing what they naturally do. That North Carolina instituted both legislatively, the state legislature, and then the wildlife resources has management authority really liberal laws, rules, to address the beaver situation. And that includes today that they can be trapped year-round. There's a trapping season, but on private property, they can be trapped year-round um, without, you don't have to have a permit. You could have somebody else come in and trap them without a permit. So, uh, if you are having damage. Um, if the person is trapping them and going to sell them, that's not allowed year round. That's only allowed during the trapping season with a permit. Um, and, and they also, they can be shot year round too um, because of the amount of damage that they cause and their, their population uh, and to address that with humans. And that's that balance between humans and wildlife living together and just the, some of the issues. Um, but it is a really, really interesting story, um, you know, a success story conservation-wise in a way, and then, but dealing with that. And that's going on with elk today in the mountains also. Like the elk were brought in by the U.S. Fish and Wildlife and they were relocated here in North Carolina. They originally had been in North Carolina a long time ago. Uh, they were brought in, I think maybe in the 80s, I can't remember for sure to the Great Smoky Mountains National Park, but it isn't fenced. And so they've moved off the park and their population numbers aren't very high. Uh, it's pretty low, but moving off the park, they're causing some issues with some property own owners in terms of the, the, they're a grazer in what they're doing. And so just like, as a, manage a wildlife management agency, um, that has, those things are all have to be addressed in some fashion. Um, okay, so that, so that, so, so those two are living there without competing with one another. What might be another animal that could potentially live in that river? Um, muskrat. Muskrat, yep. Yeah. And I've not seen, I've, I don't see muskrat holes so much there, along there. I have seen muskrat in a pond that's close to our building. Um, another animal that's very similar, I'm going to give you a big hint. Mink, all right, so this is mink. Um, and I've given it away. <laughs> mink, mink can also live in, that, in the same area as river otter and, and beaver. And if you look at, their, their scat is very much different from either one of those two. You might, as, if you've never been exposed to it and you're starting out, you might think that, oh, it's fox scat. But you want to pay attention to because it's, it's kind of tapered and twisted like fox. But one of the things to pay attention to is it's much narrower. It's got a fourth of an inch diameter and it's more braided in if, almost like the, the fur that comes out that isn't digested, it's braided. And then it can, it can loop back on itself. So mink, and this is mink scat. Um, I kind of jumped ahead and gave that away to you, but this is mink scat. This one I found on a boardwalk, a ramp going up to a, um, a bridge going over a, a huge, the Noose River, which is a big river where I live and it goes onto the ocean. And it was right in the area where, where mink would live. So mink live more along the edge of the river where Otters spend a lot of time in the middle of the river. They come out, but they spend a lot of time in the middle of the river. So mink and otter can live in the same place. And you can tell that they're not competing for the same food by what you see in their scat. So with river otter, we were seeing crayfish and um, fish scales. Meaning, so that's, that's a big part of their diet. With mink, this is fur right here, all of this, and you can see this right here, it's fur. And you'll also see little bone, this could be little bone pieces, that's hard to distinguish. So the mink are, their niche is to be, be finding their food along the edge of the bank where the rodents are, maybe the little birds, you might see feathers in their, their scat, and they also eat the amphibians, like the, the um, 
uh, if you would, uh, frogs. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yep. And so just understanding, you know, seeing some of these things in their scat tells you a whole lot about where, where they are in their habitat and how they're not, how they can all survive there. Um, really well, like they, they, they have these adaptations, their dietary adaptations allow them to not compete with these other animals. I don't, okay, so now we're, we're moving to the next one. Um, and I know, Sue, so if you know what this one is, just don't say it, let's give everybody else a, a chance to look at these things. So I'm going to give you some, some clues on this one. This one is very much different from the animals we've been looking at so far. In this particular group of animals, they have white at the tip, at the tip of their scat, their droppings, always. And sometimes they're a white splat. But this one, this one is, not, is not a splat. They, they have a lot of seed parts, and they might have lots of insect exoskeleton, so the, the, the scat is kind of friable. You could break it apart. Yeah. Turkey. Oh, yeah, how'd you know that? Do, are you a turkey hunter? Are you? Nope, okay. Do, have you seen it out in the wild? Mm-hmm. So, okay, yes, it is turkey. Now, do you, do you know that you can tell the difference between whether it's a male or a female turkey? Did you know that? You can. So the car, on your card, find turkey. And on, on, so those of you, I forgot to say, and you, hopefully you figured it out, you just have to flip your laminated sheet back and forth, and you have all the same cards as the other folks. Turkey and grouse are on the card. The, on that card, it's a male turkey scat, and this is female. And I know that, it's really interesting. Let me show you. This is female, and this is male. You see the difference? These are more like Hershey's Kisses, if you can imagine. <laughs> <laughs> and this is like, if you can imagine, this is like a J, so it's a Jake. J Jakes have a J-shaped scat, always, except when young, like the adults. And females have a kiss shaped scat with the white. And, the, and it's a, there's a physiological or an, an, an anatomical reason for that. The female's intestinal system is shaped different, so female scat comes out as a spiral. And so then, if you're out, if you're out looking for it, so um, if you're out walking this time of year, the males and the females are getting ready to mate. They're spending time with one another. They're spending, they will be walking down paths. And you can tell just by their scat whether it's a lot of females in the group or if there's males in there. So you can pay attention to the scat and you're, you'll, you'll know that. Yeah. So why the white um, coloring? Yeah, so it's bird. And birds have uric acid and that's what causes the white coloring. Mm -hmm. So it will always, you will always have some white on there, not the entire thing, all right? Um, so a couple other things so as signs of turkeys is the females will rest in areas, and you may see this. I think Babs told me that she sees this some places. We didn't see it yesterday. But you can see areas where the females may be resting. Um, you can, well, there's, so I thought somebody was going to say, well, do they, do they lay their eggs right there? So I got a picture of an egg. They actually do have a little bit of a nesting area, all right, um, that could be leaves as if it's more in the edge of a woods. The other thing that you will see this time of year, because the males are getting ready, they're trying to attract the females, and so they strut, and when they strut, their wings, their wings come out, and their, their feathers on their wings drag on the ground. So you see these drag marks are turkey feathers. And this is the same thing, but if you notice, so this one is straight. So this guy was walking like this, strutting, you know, and trying to impress the female. This one is more turned around, so they, they sometimes strut, and then they turn. And you can see that they're doing that right here. 
So all those, it, it's just fun to, to um, for me, it's been really fun to learn those things. And believe me, I've only learned a lot of this in the last 10 years. Um, it's just opened my eyes to a lot of things that I, to be more aware of out um, when we're out walking. Uh, I've seen places where it looks like they stand, they just scratch. Yep, yeah. It's like just cleared air. Yep. What is well, um, I don't know for sure, but they are could be looking for food. Uh, dusting. dusting is. And can you explain that? Oh, it's like if they're cleaning themselves. Cool. Yeah. And then this is not a very good picture, but you can see here's an adult turkey track. And here's a turkey track. You see the size difference? So these were poults, and this was the adult. So in the summertime, you can find these, these areas, and it, gives you, it can give you an idea of whether there's a lot of poults around or not. Uh, I think Bob or Babs, one of them, were telling me that they, you see a lot of poults. Um, if, you are, if you are interested, the Wildlife Resources Commission does like to have people record the number of turkeys they're seeing in the summertime. There's a window they, to get an idea of how many poults they're seeing with, with adults. And I don't understand the whole mechanism that the, the turkey biologists use, but it can give them an idea of the, um, some idea of the, what's called the recruitment, how many poults a female have been raised with a female or with a female. Um, I, does anybody fill those cards out in the summer? Is it, is it just, can you share with the other people how, if it's just turkeys that are on that or is it other ants? Mm -hmm. And so the question was, well, what if you're recording the same one every day? Well, what? They, they, they what did? Want, you should be able to tell if it, you're seeing the same one in the same place, and if they want you to record that one time, they don't want repeated uh, mm -hmm. reports of the same group. Okay. Cool. I feed uh, 25 a day turkeys. Yeah. Where do you live? Yeah. Well, <laughs> <laughs> I mean, my local reserve, as well as on Rock Horse Road, uh -huh. Red Fox. And they come for breakfast, lunch, and dinner. <laughs> and they feed on my sidewalk right at the house. I'm sure they and do. I scat is really, it looks more like chicken poop. It's not raw. Because your feet, what are you feeding them? Yeah, that's the difference. Yeah, yeah. And so the same thing with my deer. My deer come, I feed about 15 deer on the sidewalk. And that's why you have raccoons, too. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> a whole menagerie. Oh, gosh, that's great. <laughs> yeah. So what is it? Do you, I don't, have, I don't have skunk scat, but skunks are insectivores. So they, they eat 80% of their diet. And sometimes that's all you would see in their scat is insect exoskeletons. It might just be completely bee. They can they can dig up a, a bee oh, and group in. And <laughs> <laughs> All right. Okay. So we're switching. To, this is another one. This is tiny. Even though it looks big, it's tiny. An eighth to a fourth of an inch in diameter. Kind of. It's definitely rodent shaped. Yeah. Yeah. It's squirrel. Yes. Um, in, we found this yesterday. Can you see what this is? It's pine cone with the, um, the scales chewed off. That's a classic squirrel, sign of squirrels. So that was here um, in, you know, on Walnut Creek Preserve. These pictures are from my own back, my side yard. This is a tulip tree. And I have this tree and one other tree. Tony and I live on a quarter acre, a little tiny piece of property in Nightdale, North Carolina. But we have quite a few trees. Uh, and this is a really good sized tulip tree. And I started noticing this, this mark on it. 
and another tree in our backyard, the same markings. The only thing, and I don't have hardcore evidence, but the only thing I can figure out, because we don't have bears, we don't have um, gray foxes. Gray foxes can go up trees. I think it's the squirrels that they're, they're using this. What, for, for whatever reason, these two trees, they pick to gnaw on. And you can see where they're, they, it's little like shredding going on. And I know squirrels can do that. I've seen that in other places, and people have told me it's squirrels. But it's just really interesting to see that. All right, so that's squirrel. All right, so here we go to another one. OK, I'm going to give you some big hints. Raise your hand if you think you know what it is. All right, so just hold on. The other folks, I'm going to give you some hints. It's 3 fourths of an inch in diameter about. Notice these sections. It's Tootsie Roll-like. It's Tootsie Roll-like. And it's straight out a carnivore. It doesn't switch to, it doesn't eat any, it doesn't eat, um, it doesn't eat seeds. It doesn't eat anything else, sorry. It doesn't switch its diet. It's a carnivore. So all you see are hair and bone ground up. And it's, it's very dense. And then another hint is it quickly turns white uh, faster than other. It's, it's bobcat. Yeah, it's bobcat. Mm -hmm. So this one, this one was older. And even though you know, it's starting to fall apart, it's still much more dense. I'm going to show you some older coyote. This is much more dense than what coyote would be. And this one was turning white. It's not as white as some that I'm going to show you in a, in a few minutes. All right, so Oh, but that's really seem like straight up fresh. Well, I took a picture this morning of black and it looked just like the bobcat. But don't they tend to cover their Yeah, they would cover. So this is like right out and open on the trail. Oh, I, don't hmm. I don't know what to I don't know. I've never seen it like fresh myself. S send me a picture yeah, and, and uh, a Yeah, okay. Um all right. So, huh? Because they, um, it has so much bone in it, the calcium, they, they crunch up the bones, and it's the calcium that then is, you know, is starting to dry out, and that's what color it turns. Okay, I'm, I'm going to move a little bit faster because I just looked at the time, and it's like, whoa. Um, uh, all right, the one on the left. Yes, it's coyote. Mm -hmm. Uh huh. So a classic one. Um, it's got it's got the fur in there. It's tapered, a little bit twisted. Um, but you could so with coyote, you could see exoskeletons of insects. You could see berry seeds, uh, watermelon. They switch their diet depending on what's there. Yeah. Yeah, okay, all right. Because um, I called the North Carolina Wildlife Resource Commission to find out what is the actual coyote diet. And that's what interests me in scat samples, because Justin, I asked for the expert, and he said he has his master's in coyote. He, he does. said that um, he studied coyote for a year, studied their scat samples using DNA, and that 98% of their diet is rodents. And um, with a little bit of rabbit, and a little bit of white-tailed deer, and, and often um, they're mistaken for predation. It's actually scavenging white-tailed deer carcass. Mm -hmm. And um, John Kilgo uh, also told me something interesting, but I interviewed him as well. And he said that in the summer, he found that coyote, through DNA on the scat samples, mostly eat berries and um, grasshoppers. They're, they're mostly vegetarian in the summer. So I found that interesting. Yeah. They did not find any evidence of pets. But so many people that raise chickens blame the loss of their fox. And 
coyotes. Yeah, but fox can go after chickens and raccoons can and and um, birds, all of those. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's interesting stories. Yeah, that is. So um, Justin McVeigh is one of the district biologists. So Dan, are, are you? I thought Polk was in District Eight. Justin's in District Nine. Yeah, okay. So we, uh, the Wildlife Resources Commission has the state divided into nine districts, and Justin McVeigh is one of the district biologists. Oh, so this other one, that is, that is Fox, all right? And I don't, and so it's, it's smaller. Well, no, I, it's about the same, it's about the same. I think, I think I should have put one to half inch. I think I'm mistaken on that. It's generally a little bit smaller, uh, a little bit more twisted, uh, Coyote is usually longer. Um, so this is, this is the Greenway Trail where I work. I was out there uh, last week, and this spot right here is this. This was what was out there. So old scat, and when I zoomed in on it, um, this, I think, is coyote because it's looser, and it really isn't, it, uh, it's looser than, it could be coyote or bobcat, but it just has the, the shape of coyote, and you could see some teeth in there. Um, all right, so this one is a huge one. Bear. That is bear, yeah. This came from Pungo uh, National Wild Preserve, uh, National Reserve out in the coastal plains. This one came from the mountains many years ago. It's an old one. So in, out in the coastal plains, uh, a lot of the bear scat is very loose piles because they're eating corn and they've got a lot more moisture. This one was much drier and you could see insect exoskeletons. Maybe, you know, it was feeding on nuts or whatever. I'm not quite sure. But, um, and this one had a lot of grasses that ended up being in that scat. Just some signs of bears that you might see, the claw scratches on the trees. This is a rub, so this is the, the bear's head. The other picture showed the bear. This is the bear's head, and this is its body. And I'm moving through these quickly. That's raccoon. I put through that in there. That is mostly what raccoon looks like whenever I see it. Um, it, it. A lot of times, like a lot of times, it's this color, black. It almost looks like it's burnt and it has a lot of seeds in it. You see it a lot at the base of trees or in the crotch of a tree. Um, you see them on trails all the time. Okay, so let's do a little test here. Herbarium trail yesterday. What is it? Uh-huh, bobcat, yeah. And see how white it is? And it's got that blunt, yes, it was a, a Fantastic example of bobcat right there on Herbarium Trail. Uh huh. Uh, I don't know. Um, well, how, how long have you seen that there, Babs? I saw it on Wednesday, but I don't know before that. Yeah, I, I don't think that's within a day or two. It's, it's older than that, but I really have, I don't know. I'd have to, I could find out. I just, I don't know. Um, here's another one that was on Herbarium Trail yesterday. Yeah, that's what we thought. That's, I would definitely say, again, it's, it was eating an animal. You can see little bones or teeth. And just the way it's stretched out, it's looser. Um, well, that, and it's not, it's not that white color of the, bob, uh, uh, the bobcat. And then I'm going to show you a series of these. So this one. Look at this color here, right here, here, <laughs> male or female? Yeah, yeah, we didn't see any male. And that's it. 